Good afternoon. Greetings from North Carolina. Right here. So, as, first of all, thank you for the introduction. And thanks to everyone that's been great hospitality here in Northwestern Arkansas. Uh, my job for, the, for you today is to give you a little bit of an update about how things work in North Carolina's research trial. How many folks have visited the research trial? It's pretty good. Pretty good. So, I'll go right through this. This is what I'm going to talk about today. A little bit about our organization from a context standpoint. And a little bit about our market. About half of you have been there, but about half of you have not. So I want to give you a little bit more about that. And in a little bit of a comparison. And you guys have been very kind to have already done a lot of that. So I'm using your slides before the recent work that you did. I'm going to talk a little bit about transit in the triangle area, which is what we call our area, the research triangle area. Some history, some business engagement with it as well. A couple quick observations. And I'll, it says discussion, but we're going to wait until my colleague Mark does his presentation from Indianapolis. Then that. So first about our organization. So our job is to serve as the voice of the business community in the triangle area. We've been doing that since 2002. We have 23 member chambers of commerce in 10 counties in central eastern North Carolina. We work together as a federation, along with 100 leading companies across our market, and they invest between $500 and $10,000 a year in the RTA to provide a business voice for, for transportation or on transportation. Uh, what we do every day are these three things. Identify opportunities. I mean, surveying the landscape, trying to find out how things are working, what possible changes could be made. Provide focus. That's the, the beauty of having a dedicated organization. And then unite, unite the business community. And that's how we're set up to do that. And the more reason to do it is that last line, to make the triangle region move faster. And speed is a really important thing in a fast growing area. If you're a very fast growing area, we're a fast growing area. So speed is very important. That's our website, letsgetmoving.org. We were going to do something like let's get fixing to get ready to do something, but we didn't. We picked letsgetmoving.org because we got to go faster. That's right. Um, why do we exist? We always got to start with why. You've heard that phrase in business. Same with us. Accelerate these priorities, policies, and practices for the reason the bullet, you use this here as well in Northwest Arkansas. Economy, quality of life. That's why you do it. So you've heard those things. These are some of the things that we have done. Uh, as an organization, uh, we don't own any roads, we're a business group, right? We're not, we don't run the roads in the transit system, but we help make these things happen. Things such as the referenda, <coughs> states, even freeway speed limit increases. So here's some successes we've had. I say this not from a bragging, from a context standpoint. These are the types of things we work on. Our first turnpike, a widening of, of a freeway that needed it, something called the bus on shoulder system a new interstate designation. Just as you've recently had your I-49, uh, which was 540, we have a U.S. highway that now is an interstate as well. So there's a good context and similarity there. Uh, so you understand how we operate. We tend to not uh, look for these very, very expensive, expensive things and make and when the government planners have a project, we tend to not look for something even larger. Uh, we're trying to get something done. And so what you have on this slide is the entire history of our 15 years of all the projects that we advocated for or suggestions that were more expensive than major projects that were running books. It's a long history, right? So let's go through that. So now let's go to uh, this. That's a little tongue-in-cheek for that. A little bit about the Triangle region and the overview for that. So here's where we're located. Uh, the ocean here, of course, I-85, I-95, the national capital, Atlanta, and so on. We're in between I-85 and I-95. And we are right on I-40, just as you guys are just north of I-40, so we're the same latitude. Uh, north Carolina as a state has done well from a business standpoint. I won't read those, but you can see some of the rankings in terms of business climate and business costs and, and so on. North Carolina has been very successful uh, in, in many measures. Not every, but, but many measures have done well. Um, here's the triangle, and I said it's not a triangle, but it, it is, but we have three counties, and the counties are really in a line. So you travel from one to the next to the next and so on. But Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, that's the first public charter uh, university, Duke University is a private school, you also have to do and NC State is Carolina's largest university. And so a lot, in the case of two public schools, a lot of the programs do not duplicate as well. So you have one engineering emphasis on one, and one more works on the other. And that's how we're set up. Um, a piece of information that would be helpful to understand, and hopefully this will give you a sense it's more of a line back and forth rather than a triangle like that. Uh, we have a number of employment centers 
We have our university, NC State, another one at Chapel Hill, another one at Duke, that's um, something called Research Triangle Park, which you may have heard of. We have about 50,000 employees just in that. The population of Research Triangle Park is zero. It is the size of Manhattan, uh, from, the, from the northern border of Central Park to the Battery, if you want that as an analogy. No one lives there. It's 50,000 people, uh, or 50,000 workers, downtown Raleigh, a couple other areas, and so on. And so what happens is people are traveling from everywhere to everywhere. So it's a many-to-many -many situation, if you want to think of it that way. So very similar, I think, to what happens here in Northwest Arkansas, up in there 49, and so on, back and forth, and so on. Maybe even more so there. Uh, one other thing that maybe that will not be uh, obvious on this map, but our commute is backwards, so in the morning people leave the cities and go towards the research triangle park and they reverse in the afternoon. So it's a very odd commute from that standpoint. So comparisons, Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, Beth, Little Fayetteville, the distances are essentially the same. So our market scale-wise is the same. Within the research triangle, uh, uh, it's a larger area, but best big city, hottest city, best place for business. We're happy number 13, best place to live in America. We're sure beating us right nicely there. You're number five, number 13 for that. But we're both, both great places to live, great places for jobs. So more comparisons, you guys came out with this nice report that uh, we stumbled upon via Google in preparation for this, and we should use your data instead. So we'll go with that. So in terms of population, you can very simply, um, our, our market population is about three and a half times in every Okay, That's roughly what we're looking at. We're about two million, a little less than that. Uh, net population increase, as you can see. Over 30 people a day here, very strong, and we're at about 80, which is also very strong. But we're starting from a larger base, so your percentage is even higher. In terms of just some factors, which I think are important, is when you think of transportation, they need to be in the context of other things that are important to your community. And so educational attainment, uh, that is one thing that our market scores uh, ridiculously high on in terms of the percentage with higher adult education there. Uh, median household income, uh, and again, let me show you this real quick. So this, this splits us, because the government split us between Durham and Raleigh as two separate MSAs. We're really happy that you picked both of ours, it would be very hard to show these comparisons when you did your comparison. Uh, the, 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 to those of us who live in the triangle, we don't think of it as two separate metro areas. It's just, I mean, the research triangle part is physically in both metro areas, because it goes between the two counties. So we think of it as one, but since the data is this way, we'll use it. You can see the comparison between the median household. Uh, in terms of cost of living, you do very well. You can see the percentages there were a little bit higher than that, and, and it goes back to the other pieces we're talking about. Uh, poverty rankings, I think you're similar to Durham, Chapel Hill, and a little not quite as good as where Raleigh is right now. Um, commuting, this is an interesting graphic since this is a transportation presentation. This talks about the people who are traveling more than 30 minutes. Um, I would probably be cautious with a number like this. One of the reasons why our numbers may be so high is we're attracting people from such a large area. So I don't know that commuting more than 30 minutes is necessarily good or bad. So just be aware of that. But you can see the comparisons there. Um, airfare, I think you, you're, you're aware of this as an issue here because of the size yes. of the airport. You know that. Uh, on the flip side, you punch above your weight because of having the airport that you have given your population. So if you look at it that way, it's pretty good. Our, ours are pretty good. Uh, comparatively, uh, Charlotte is our largest city. Their airport is much larger than ours in terms of uh, usage. Their fares are a little bit higher because they're hot. Uh, so go beyond that. So here's our population growth trajectory. You can see the top line is population, the bottom is employment. And if I can use this little graphic here, here's where we are today. We're at about the 2 million mark for here, a little less than a million for jobs. Here are the industries that we focus on, just to give you the comparison. Software, and you can see that. Uh, this is a number that I think is more, they say more useful, maybe more informative for congestion. Uh, when we compare some of our other markets, uh, Denver, San Diego, Nashville, uh, Pittsburgh, and so on, our congestion numbers are much lower. And the reason is because we're spread out. And that makes, tra that makes highway travel much easier. And it's the complete opposite for transit. Because transit wants density of people close together. Um, peak hour congestion within the region. Again, you can see compared to these cities, we're lower than uh, what we would consider our peers in terms of uh, economically. And so here's a couple more things. So when we talk about transit, some people say, should we invest in roads or should we invest in transit? They've heard that conversation. And I really want to encourage you to, to the extent you can remove that thinking from your vocabulary, your thought process, it would probably be helpful because uh, your buses probably travel on roads. Our buses travel on roads, so your buses probably travel on roads. Many vans will travel on roads and so on. 
So when you're investing in roads, you are investing in transit infrastructure. And if you do it right, you can make a, you can actually reduce some of the cost of transit because the roads are taking care of that. Rail is different, of course, but roads and transit are not are not enemies by any stretch of the imagination. So be aware of that. So with that in mind, here are some of the investments we've made in our market just since 2000, which hasn't been that long ago. Everything that's highlighted, it's not just a thin red or black line, is something new in our market. And so you can see the freeways that have been constructed. If they're green, it's new. If it's orange, it's yellow, whatever color that is, that is a widening of the freeway. So you can see a significant amount of investment there for us. And this is what we're going to do in the next nine years. And again, uh, the, the green highlights are more new freeways, the yellow are more uh, freeway widenings of some sort, and the blue are roads that are not freeways today that we're going to turn into freeways, which means there won't be any stoplights. These are significant investments. You may have heard the phrase, you cannot build your way out of congestion. Has anybody heard that phrase before? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, what I would caution you about uh, with that phrase is, it is true you cannot build your way out of congestion in the middle of a downtown uh, during rush hour. And you also cannot build your way out of congestion during the peak of the peak in a very fast-growing area up beyond a certain point. But you should not, this is the position here, uh, you should not use that thinking or that element of truth to stop building your freeway system, to stop building your road network. Because you're going to continue to need those investments as you move forward. So be aware of that. Uh, because you, quite frankly, can build your way out of the most congestion in a market that is of moderate density or better. Not all of it, but a lot of it, or at least reduce the duration and severity of your peak period. Just be aware of it. Uh, and, and this will show an example of the reason why I show you these investments. So Durham is our second largest city. And these, uh, the tactical word I believe is isochrome, which is the um, how far you can go in a certain amount of time. You don't need to know what these cities are per se, which you can just do from spatial comparison. This is 2010, this is 2030. We expect with our investments, even population growth, to be able to get from Durham to Raleigh in the same amount of time, 20 years from now, even with the population growth, because we're making the investments. So airport, we're not to belabor that, but those are the non-stops that we have. Um, and we'll go straight to transit. So the history of transit and the triangle market, I divide into two areas, uh, before and after 2012. And there's a reason for that. Um, I mentioned, and maybe for a little more context, I mentioned Chapel Hill and Durham and Raleigh. And I think you probably at least have heard of those communities if you haven't visited them. You know where those are, basically. Well, they're in three different counties. They're all in a line. And what I'll preview for you is they all have had transit referendum, and none of them voted on the same day. In fact, none of them voted on the same year. Here's what happened. So as a business group, we back in 2005 started visiting different cities. San Diego, uh, Indianapolis, uh, Dallas, Denver, and so on. Um, we lobbied for what's called local option legislation, which is a sales tax that would benefit for transit. We lobbied successfully for that in the legislature. Uh, we conducted annual polls of our respective counties to see what interest they would have in supporting a half cent sales tax for transit. And then by 2011, the first county, Durham, was ready to go for a referendum. Orange and Chapel Hill area, that's another county to the west, they voted but a different year. In both cases, there are very strong passage rates, 60% in favor, which is very strong. But again, the key pieces are not similar. Um, and again, I work for business group, and here's what this context comes in. So then here's the second part of transit. So Durham County and Orange County are, are certainly large and growing, uh, but Wake County, which is where Raleigh is, is the majority of the population. So it's probably 60 to 70, probably 70% 70 of those three counties were in one. And uh, we as a business group were looking at the proposal for our transit plan or our trans transit in our community. Uh, and we asked some questions. We weren't sure exactly how well this is going to work. And ultimately, to give it away here, we formally opposed the, the transit plan in 2012. We just were not comfortable with what it was going to deliver. It was a light rail and commuter rail based plan for our market, along with some bus expansion, uh, but no bus rapid transit. And so what we did is we endorsed a BRT based approach. We created this, what we call a transit innovation series, brought in speakers both through Skype and directly to talk about what this option might mean. Uh, we filmed a video where we actually had one of our major companies funded it. And we flew out to the West Coast to see it in action, BRT, did more tours of communities, and then a new process emerged for transit to look at the plan differently. We did initial research, and then we ended up endorsing the revised plan 
And then I ended up running the media marketing strategy for the campaign in 2016, for the referendum which did pass, which was 52.7%. So here's a little bit about what our process looked like, the new process. We had a huge advisory committee. We identified choices and trade-offs, and that was really important. Uh, Jared Walker and Killian Horn worked on that. And the specific names here obviously don't matter to NWA area here, but you can see universities. We have 12 municipalities in our county, the largest county, and so they were represented from all of them, business leaders, chambers, and so on. And, and so what we, were, what we were looking at was trade-offs. And you might think of trade-offs as a little different. You might say goals, or what do I want? What do we want transit to do? And so you can think of trade-offs on a number of scales. The ones that were chosen were this, more infrastructure and more operating. This is more buses or whatever, and this is more bus lanes or whatever. That's the basic trade-off. And here this is, should we pick, put as much money on the routes that are gonna have the most ridership, or should we put as many routes as possible to serve as many people as possible, or at least as much land as possible, more precisely? And what's the right answer to that? Right, there's no right answer, right? It's a policy choice, right? It depends what your goals are, right? Where we ended up is here. Almost halfway in between more lanes versus more buses, but we definitely were more towards ridership than we were towards coverage and land. And what's interesting is where we currently are is actually here. Actually, we're actually technically we're here, where we have no bus lanes, and we're over there. So technically that's where we are. So more specific here, there's nothing technical about this slide at all, but this might be instructive for you to think about your area for transportation. So our situation, very high growth market as we've established, growing traffic congestion. Yes, the numbers are lower compared to the markets, but there's a perception in our market it's getting a lot worse, and there's some truth to that. Uh, very dispersed county, the current travel options are not convenient, funding does not grow on trees, and we're in the middle of a rapid technology change thing. We all know that. These are all statements of fact for our market or overall. So our plan is to try to marry those. High growth, let's try to get something we can expand rapidly. Growing traffic congestion, we need to find some way for peak period relief. In our case, it's I-40, and yours is I-49. Uh, dispersed county, uh, region, it's not just, even though we're all in one line in terms of the large things, that's just showing where some of the job centers are, where the people are, are everywhere across the whole county, and there's no natural barriers to develop. We don't have big mountain ranges in our area. We don't have huge lakes in the middle of the, of the triangle. So we have an airport in the middle, that's about the only barrier. And a, a, a state park, it's my bad. Um, frequent services are marrying for inconvenient travel options have something look frequent. Uh, limited funding, so let's scale it. And given technology change, let's build something we can have sooner and then see where we see what that does for us. So that was the thinking process. So this is comparing the old plan that we had with the one that we approved that are now implemented. Commuter rail is the same, but even that uh, frequencies may look a little different. We had no bus rapid transit before. Now we have 20 miles of it. It doesn't exist yet, but we're studying it and getting ready for implementation. Um, we're gonna double bus service, now we'll triple it instead. Our frequent service network, every 15 minute buses all day, we weren't gonna do any of that initially. We'll have 66 of that, I keep on the wrong button. I apologize. Uh, time horizon, was a 20 year plan before, now it's 10. Uh, you can't have all this better, just out of magic, so we lost the light rail core. We went from 17 to zero. And so that was the trade off. Uh, is one better than the other? Yeah, I think so. I think the one that writes a lot better. It worked a lot better. It fit our community better. So we're happy about it. So um, you can see this. I won't get all the details here, but because that's just a repetition of it. Um, here are an example of what bus rapid transit could look like. This is in Virginia. This is a tour we recently took. This is Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, and their BRT line. This is Arlington, Virginia, and their bus rapid transit line as well. So it's actually the same quarter, just it looks a little different because it's in a different time. Uh, one thing we're pushing is the concept of red lanes. Across the country, bus lanes are being painted red. And to us, red could also stand for something. Red could stand for right turns could use them. It could stand for emergency response could use them. And it could stand for driveway access. Because you don't have to have one bus every 15 minutes and have it just empty for 14 minutes and 35 seconds. It's not really good for political and popular support. There could be other uses that will not will have only marginal impact on the bus, but have a better use of the lane. Uh, we also have a bus on shoulder system that we advocated for and coordinated. It is exactly what you think. It uses the outside shoulder of the freeway. And it works very nicely. Uh, and for those who are curious, you can only use the bus on shoulder when the speeds on the highway go below 35. So you don't have people zooming down the down it. 
And, and in fact, you can only go 15 miles an hour faster than adjacent traffic, but no more than 35. So if traffic is a wreck and it's a dead stop on our interstate, the bus can only go 15. You might say, well, well, 15 miles an hour, that's not very good. I promise you, if everybody stopped and you're in a bus and you're moving, that will be the most exhilarating 15 mile an hour trip you have ever had in your life. So, uh, 540, which was actually the old name of your interstate, uh, we have express shoulder lanes that have been approved and we're going to use the inside shoulder, the buses are on the outside, we're going to use the inside shoulder because it's cheaper than building a full-blown one of those express lanes that you may have seen in Houston or Atlanta. These are some other pictures real quick. This is a commuter rail which is being proposed. And just for grins, I thought I'd show you the one on the left which is not a rail, that's actually a bus. And we're going to have that, that beginning for us as our cross-regional bus as a pilot uh, this summer. Um, Again, we're building what we call rapid corridors, rapid with meaning 15 minute frequency. Uh, we're building six. One is light rail, that's the drone to Chapel Hill one. The other five are not. So you can mix and match. So of our six, we're only going to have one light rail, the other five will be BRT. Um, this shows the regional map showing both bus and rail. Rail green, bus off yellow. And so then here's our frequent network. This will show you this. Um, I can't reach it completely, but kind of if you cover this lower line, because that didn't exist until a year ago, after the referendum passed, that was our first line that came in. So this is what we have now. A year ago, we didn't have that. And within 10 years, it'll look like that. And that's 15 minute service. The thick lines will be bus rapid transit. The whole thing will be done uh, within 10 years, or nine years now. Uh, and so this shows the kind of the why, in terms of we want as a business organization, we want more people to have access to better transportation. And so in terms of accessibility to the frequent service network, both jobs and population, they're going to double in 10 years, more than double in 10 years. And you can see that. And then this shows connecting all the communities of Wake County with express buses and dedicated local buses and so on. This doesn't show all bus routes by any stretch of the imagination. It's just the routes between communities. But you can see this level of expansion. And this compares us with other markets. Wake is to the right. Durham and Chapel Hill are actually over here. And they were, they were good even before the referendum. Um, with the new referendum, we're going to have much more of a service per capita, but still below Durham and Chapel Hill. Uh, we have a referendum, I can describe that. Here are some of the messaging. I'll pause for a second, you can read it. And you can see some of the themes that we talked about during the referendum. Uh, we had a campaign committee, uh, both a Democratic and Republican town, uh, town mayor, a developer, an HBCU president, uh, a number of organizations. The, name, the specific names don't matter, but the names will give you the sense of the types of groups that were on the committee. Um, either a contact strategy, who we would try to reach out to, uh, contacted a lot of people, obviously, uh, had a nice colorful sign, then we realized that the sign was not readable, and so we came up with a nice simpler sign. <laughs> It'll work better. So that way you have to learn the lessons as you go. Right? And that was the final number. And what was interesting is the polls from 2009 on were pretty much in that same general area, but because some of them were below 50, we really had to be cautious. And so that's what we ended up with. Uh, this may astound you. Uh, we will have one billion in new local funds for transit by 2018, the majority being here, that larger pump up of the orange line. Uh, in terms of that, uh, we have 100 million a year now coming in for local transit, not for roads, just for transit. Um, and actually just for Wake County, just for one county. Um, here is the funding for it, local is that. We have no reliance on the state in Wake County at all. It's just been done by the federal government if we get it and local. And then the beauty of the Wake Transit Plan is that um, if, the, if the federal money doesn't come in, you can still build elements of bus rapid transit, which is good. So here's the timetable, everything will be done in 10 years. Uh, some of it is already in. And here's the scale of one you can see, we go from our ridership and coverage, getting more ridership and prioritizing the reach. This is the, this access, this is the technical aspect. This is what we're interested in the business community. How can we get more of our residents acting, accessing more jobs? That's the reason, if you want to why, that's, there's your why. That's what we're trying to get done. And so a couple of final observations and I'm done. Um, and so what is this for? Well, this is a reminder. Um, I could have a whole presentation on autonomous vehicles and all the new technology. 
And do you know when fully autonomous vehicles are going to be in everybody's household? Of course you don't. I don't either. But what I do know is more of it's coming. And this was an announcement this week from Ford that their self-driving network will launch at scale nationwide in three years. So we've gone from startups to a company that we've all heard of and talk about something very specific. And so we need to be aware of that. And that's going to be a disruption. So given that, and given everything else I've talked about, I want to mention just a few thoughts. Um, how do you deal with transit and transportation? This is obviously not just on transit. Given growth, high growth area, and uncertainty. How do you do it? Here's some thoughts. One, gain consensus of what problem you're trying to solve. Really try to think about what is the problem you're trying to solve. For us, it was a sense of growth and a desire, a, a sense of the congestion is getting away from us, and a desire to better accessibility for our employees and associates. What is the problem you're trying to solve here? Figure that out, be precise about it if you can. Work backwards from that based on what your goals are. The third one, belief is for years in our organization, I encourage you here in Northwest Arkansas, you have a wonderful community, it's already very obvious in just a few hours visiting. Um, build the system that for your region, don't, I mean, you can go in inner city business, we've done it, but don't say, oh, Nashville has that, so let's take that, or Raleigh has that, so no. Find the thing that's gonna work for you. And both now as you grow. Consider disruptive forces. And so, and the final piece for here is, it will work for us as you've heard, regional, being regional does not require doing everything together at the same time. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, people said if we don't vote together, we're not regional. I'm like, that is complete crap. Uh, regional means we work together on issues. It doesn't mean we do everything exactly the same. Every member in your family doesn't do everything exactly the same. You just agree you're all going to work together and make, every, make everything better. Think of yourself as one of the phrases we use in our market is like a family of communities. You are a family of communities of about 49, so think about how that can work for you. Again, we voted from Durham and Raleigh, voted five years apart. And we're still about what we need to be. The other thought, so in terms of what, how the business community engages, uh, we focus on ensuring critical wins, as you've seen, we value results. We do collaborate with the public sector. We can't do anything alone. We don't own anything. So we have to value the relationship. Uh, the reason we do things are not, transportation is not an end in itself, right? Transportation is, a, is an enabling factor, and there are other ones that we went through in the comparison, some of which are probably more important. So we always advocate for the region of the people. That's the why. Remember that success is not automatic. It's not accidental, and it's not guaranteed. These things do not happen by themselves. They do require focused attention. And the final thing is a little mantra for us, faster is better. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Fisher, Chief Policy Officer, Indy Chamber. Uh, the Indy Chamber is a uh, uh, traditional chamber started in 1890 by Colonel Eli Lilly, so we've done member services and advocacy. Uh, we actually reformed because of a transportation challenge. Uh, uh, if you've ever been to Indianapolis, our downtown is a very compact downtown, but our organization was formed to pave the mile square of downtown Indianapolis. And there was a, a bunch of uh, business leaders that came together to solve big problems in, uh, of, of quality of life in, in central Indiana and Indianapolis. Uh, about six years ago, we merged in our Indianapolis Economic Development Corporation. I had been with the chamber. I left to go to the EDC and merged, uh, came back to the chamber through the merger with the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and with that, we brought a nine-county uh, economic development entity called the Indy Partnership, which is very external-facing. Uh, the, uh, they, they work with site selectors. They really get uh, companies interested in central Indiana and then it's up to the individual communities to compete for that talent and those jobs. Uh, we also have a, a uh, entrepreneurship services division, so we're an SBA intermediary. Uh, we uh, do business coaching, uh, business planning, micro lending, and so we're really soup to nuts from the person that rolled out of bed with an idea and didn't know how to turn it into a business all the way up to an Eli Lilly and company and, and uh, Anthem insurance company. So uh, economic development, businesses large and small, really the voice of the central Indian business community. Uh, we, we're very proud of things that we have going on in, in Indianapolis. We are an industrial, uh, formal industrial city. Actually, the Brookings Institute just came out of a report called us an older industrial city. Um, but we've got a great, 
we've, we've got a lot of great things going on. Uh, the downtown, I think when Raleigh came, they were specifically looking at our downtown uh, compact, very uh, great for conventions, sporting events. And uh, the, our downtown group actually just released that we now have 28,000 people that have moved to downtown uh, in the past 10 years. So we now have a resurging downtown, but we also are growing as a region as well. Uh, so this is a snapshot of our region. We are a nine county in the, uh, the yellow here. So central uh, Indianapolis, Marion County, we are what's called the Unigov system. Uh, in 1970, we merged our city and county functions. So we are 400 square miles of legacy infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's tremendous, it's a great opportunity, uh, but it comes with a certain amount of challenges. And really the Unigov structure treated us well for about 40 years. And then about the mid 90s, people started hopping over uh, the, the county boundaries. So these are the surrounding eight counties that we would consider central Indiana. Uh, we are a regional economy and a regional workforce. Uh, we have about 205,000 people drive into Indianapolis. So essentially the third largest city in Indiana drives into Indianapolis every day for employment. Uh, we've got about 50,000 people uh, uh, leaving uh, Marion County to go uh, work in surrounding communities as well. So uh, right here would be a big, uh, uh, Walmart actually has a very large presence uh, in this side of the town is where uh, logistics and warehousing district is. Uh, but a lot of the job growth we've seen in the region is on the periphery of our region. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, high-end, high-value uh, corporate jobs being created in downtown Indianapolis, being increasingly being filled by people that don't live in the city. Uh, but we're, we really are challenged with providing that reverse commute and integrated workforce housing policies outside of Indianapolis Marion County. So uh, again, we're a, a nine county region, but we're an 11 county MSA. I don't know where those other two counties really come from. Uh, we're about 1.9 million people as a region. Half the people live in Indianapolis, Marion County, and half live in the surrounding eight counties. Uh, but those surrounding eight counties are the fastest growing communities in, uh, in Indiana. Uh, we have 92 counties in Indiana. We only have 14 that are, we'll see a working age population increase. Uh, and the majority of people coming to Central Indiana are from other parts of the state. So smaller communities, uh, people are moving to the metro areas for jobs, education, specialized healthcare, quality of life. Um, and, but we need to be more attractive to people that are outside of our state and making sure that we are attractive to talent from across the world. Um, again, about 205,000 people drive into Indianapolis every day, but 160,000 uh, commuters net. Downtown Indianapolis is really the heart of the state and the heart of the, of the region. 4% uh, of all jobs in the state of Indiana are in a very small, compact downtown Indianapolis. 11% of all jobs that pay over $40,000 a year in the state of Indiana are in, are in compact downtown Indianapolis. So we are very, while well, we are regional, we're very, very uh, reliant on the jobs produced in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, but we have challenges. Um, uh, since 2005, we've lost 20% of our manufacturing base. In fact, we, uh, only Cleveland and Detroit have seen the larger exodus of traditional manufacturing from the urban core. Um, I was just saying that, you know, new arrivals, I didn't grow up in Indianapolis, new arrivals, we don't really think of Indianapolis as an industrial city, uh, but we have seen decade after decade erosion of our manufacturing base, and that's really changed the fabric of our community where, where uh, large-scale production facilities once existed, poverty now existed. So we've had a fundamental change in our economy, but also a change in the location of those jobs. And so we've had to really rethink how we provide mobility to jobs, education, and healthcare. And that's really the key messages. Again, poll early and poll often if you're thinking about transit. Um, we pulled early and we pulled often, and those messages about access to jobs, education, and healthcare never change. We want a transit referendum 6040 and never once mentioned congestion. Because we don't have congestion in the central Indiana. But we do have a challenge in making sure that people have great access to jobs. And that's how we approach it from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, yeah, so when we lost 20% of our manufacturing base in the region, 90% of those were in Marion County alone. And that, again, has led to a proliferation of poverty. So this is Indianapolis, and these are the surrounding communities. A red dot means you earn less than $15,000 a year. An orange dot means you earn less than $35,000 a year. So we have uh, largely economically segregated as a community, and that be largely because of where those large-scale production facilities once existed 
now poverty exists. And job creation happening up here, and then in the dense urban corridor, we really had to take a step back and, and question and, and really rethink how we are providing that job access. So here's some realities of our current transit system. Uh, we're, the sixth, we're the 15th largest city and the 83rd largest bus fleet. Uh, we, starting in about the late 70s, um, decided that we we're going to treat transit as, a, as another, another form of welfare. It was a social safety net. The only people that would ride in to go are the people that had to ride in to go. But as, as consumer tastes have changed, as, as millennials have embraced uh, multimodal transit, uh, transportation options, and as the location and nature of jobs has changed, it has caused us to rethink and really reinvest in our transit system. Uh, we're 64th in employment accessible by transit, 11% fewer jobs within a normal 20% commute uh, since 2000. 79% of our senior population has poor access to transit. So you think you start to think about all the people that are impacted by increased mobility that transit provides. Uh, it's, uh, we like to say it's not a silver bullet to any one issue that, or challenge that your community is facing, but it is, an, it is such a critical component to solving so many of those challenges. And uh, we've had serious issues with food deserts. So access to healthy food, this, this issue of social determinants of health, when you have higher rates of smoking, higher rates of obesity, an unhealthy workforce, we, we like North Carolina, have a great business climate. Uh, and a lot of that could be lost if we don't start to address the long-term impact of an unhealthy workforce that makes an unproductive workforce. So, uh, like the Raleigh Chamber that came to Indianapolis what, six years ago, maybe, um, we started doing what we call leadership changes as, as a chamber. We take about 120 business and civic and government leaders to a different city to learn best practices and how they are, are confronting similar challenges. And we made our first trip to uh, Denver in 2008. We had a, a property tax revolt. We had a uh, kind of a Tea Party Republican mayor. A former Marine beat a, a Democratic mayor that had, in July, a 65% approval rating until the property tax bill showed up. Uh, and we had the surprise mayor. They actually called him the accidental mayor. Um, not the, 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 the typical person that you think that would start to lead the charge on stuff like bike lanes and, and transit. But we took him out to Denver and he, he looked at the current planning and said, you guys are all only talking about one route, right? There are tons of studies out there. Studies that had been put on a shelf on transit. And we had uh, an MPO that was talking about one line. We're just gonna invest in one line. It actually happened to be the line that has the least density of residential and job density. Um, and so he said, I can't go sell a line. I see the benefits of transit, see what Denver has done with their transit system, community redevelopment, workforce mobility, economic development, talent attraction. We need to do something, but I can't sell one line. So he charged the business community to form a task force and working with our public, state, our, our public sector partners so the Indianapolis Metropolitan Planning Organization, our regional transit authority that has no money and no real operations, but they're an authority. Uh, Indigo is our public transportation corporation. I'm, I also now serve on the board of Indigo and our, uh, our state department of transportation. We partnered our realtors association. I, I made sure to take a picture of the, of the realtor here, uh, signed here and send it to our, our coalition partners uh, locally. Our community foundation, the chamber and our corporate partnership came together and as our, our public agency partners were doing their long-term planning, uh, we, were, we hired a firm to do an, uh, an, a return on investment study. Here are the options that they're providing. We're gonna measure what will have the highest economic return on investment. What's gonna get us the biggest bang for our buck and make sure that it helps our economy grow? Um, what we came up with was a grand vision for uh, a nine county regional transit system or nine county uh, governing body uh, and it would have uh, doubled the local bus service and Marion and Hamilton County's express uh, bus service between all the counties, circulator routes and five rapid transit uh, corridors. This is really important to understand. Plans change. Plans evolve. And it's very important as you're thinking about um, all of these issues that you're managing the expectations. Uh, one of the things that we, we kind of messed up right out of the gate was when we unveiled the Indy Connect uh, initiative, we produced some really, really slick videos that uh, showed this light rail line going down one of the major streets in Indianapolis and buildings literally popping up out of the ground. 
Um, no, we don't have any light rail lines. We're not pushing light rail lines. We're pushing bus rapid transit. And so uh, managing the expectations on the front end, but also understanding and communicating very clearly. As we, as transportation planners do, they will go in a room and they'll, they'll do their thing. And then you have to go get public input. And then you vet it through various elected officials. You vet it through various community groups. And if the planners are doing their job, they'll take that feedback and adjust the plan. So our plan adjusted. And it adjusted again. And so one of the challenges that we had, what we realized we had no dedicated revenue stream. So we went to the General Assembly. For four years we failed to pass enabling legislation that allowed us to hold a referendum. Our legislature did not want to even give us the ability to ask our residents if they want to invest in transit for four years. We were finally able to convince them, but there were a lot of concessions made. One, the legislature banned our ability to even consider light rail. Once we, our plan evolved, we weren't looking at rail anymore. We knew that we were going with bus rapid transit. We were fine with it. They created a three-step process. Uh, we first had to convince our city county council to put it on the ballot. Then we had to go win a referendum. And then once we won, we had to go back and actually have the city county council vote to enact that tax. They created so many hurdles, I think that they never thought we would be successful. Um, and we didn't get the regional governing body. We had to go with one county, county by county. Uh, and so since Indianapolis Marion County already had a fixed route transit system, uh, we decided to go uh, first in Indianapolis Marion County and have a really show the proof of concept. Uh, again, plans changed between when we started the legislative process and when we were able to actually hold a referendum, uh, the plan changed again. They, they had to update their plan every five years. So when we went to, this is the, uh, a snapshot of the current system. I know this is a little washed out, but uh, the majority of our routes are only coming every half hour. Uh, and if you're lucky, they're coming every half hour, but most, a lot of them are coming once every hour. You have to plan your life around when the bus comes, when they're only coming at that level of frequency. We're also a spoken hub system. So if you, this route was added late to the game, but if, before, if you wanted to, if you lived here and worked here, you would have had to come all the way downtown to transfer downtown and then go back up to the northwest part of our city. And so what we looked at was, again, the, ride, the coverage versus ridership model. This is a coverage model. You're trying to cover as much of 400 square miles as possible. You, that is very inefficient. That leads to, to uh, reduced service hours and uh, less frequency. What we went to, we hired Jared Walker, uh, just like Raleigh did, to redesign our system. And we went to a, uh, a ridership model. We really doubled down on the routes that had the highest residential and job density. Frequency, residential density, and job density are the three biggest indicators of transit usage. So we built a system, and we also went to a grid system. So there's more convenient transfer points, so you're not having to come all the way down to the central district to transfer out to your final destination. So the new system will be based off of the majority of the routes will come every 15 minutes or half hour. Uh, right now, Indigo runs three schedules, a weekday schedule, a Saturday schedule, and a Sunday schedule. We will be running every route every day and extended service hours, 20, no, sorry, 19 hours a day our buses will be running. Uh, we like to say we can get you to a Pacers game, but we can't get you home, especially if you work there. We have 75,000 people in Indianapolis, Central Indiana that work in the, uh, the hospitality and convention business. These are people that make our city work yet our, service, our bus service was not helping them and not servicing them. And so we, we're, this is the new system as the voters voted upon in uh, uh, 2016, November 2016, we won 60-40. So we go to the grid system, more frequent uh, service hours, longer service hours, and three rapid transit lines. The first of which will be the red line, which will go from our cultural district to the north of Rodderpool, down through uh, the Midtown area, right here, this area, to downtown. 1% of Indigo's current service territory and 15% of its current ridership. It will go, it touches 90% uh, of the college students in our region will be within a half a mile stop of the red line, and it touches every single one of our major employers in Indianapolis. It will go from our cultural district to downtown to the University of Indianapolis, and hopefully uh, we will be extending it to the county boundaries and up through our affluent, uh, affluent suburbs of, of Hamilton County and then down south uh, to our, our uh, communities to the south. Uh, the purple line 
We'll go from uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison, which is houses the largest, like if you were in the military and you had the check process, it's probably coming through Fort Ben. Uh, Fort Ben, down our, our main arterial, east-west arterial, and then it connects into the red line. When those two bus rapid transit lines connect here, they will have a bus rapid transit line that, that comes every five minutes. Uh, they only stop every five blocks, and, and we will be the first all-electric BRT system in the nation. Uh, so our, our buses, they feel like trains, they're quiet. Actually, I've heard, and I don't know if this is purely rumor, but some, some communities have had to add artificial noise to their electric buses because people are getting hit by them because they don't know they're coming. I was, I was at a conference, the American Public Transportation Association conference in Atlanta last year, and I was sitting next to, to our bus, and I didn't know it was on. It's, it's that silent. So um, they will come, the built-in station areas, as Joe talked about, and then our blue line will go from the county boundary to the east along Washington Street, one of our major east-west corridors, all the way to our airport. It is our hope, because of the benefits of bus rapid transit, it has the benefits of a light rail as, as far as the built-in station areas and the transit-oriented development, that we are able to find some revenue to extend uh, the bus rapid transit line, blue line, all the way along this local street to the airport. Right now, it gets about halfway there and it jumps on our interstate highway to our airport. Uh, th and this is a major employment center for the district as well. And the impact. Why, did, why does the chamber care about transit and helping people uh, get, get uh, access? Well, uh, we're tripling the residents in poverty that have access to high frequency uh, transit service, tripling our seniors that have access to high uh, frequency transit. AARP was one of the biggest supporters of our transit initiative. Their number one issue of their members is aging in place. So as the baby members age, they don't necessarily want to have to go leave the house that they raise their family in. They want to age in place. And that requires that they, once they are, lose their ability to, to drive their own vehicles, they want to be mobile and live healthy and active lives. Households with a disabled resident, tripling. Households with no car, uh, and then the minority population, but we're tripling the, the, the minority population with access to high frequency transit. So again, uh, making it a reality, uh, it was a five year plan, so from 2016 to 2021, uh, Marion County Transit Referendum is asking for 0.25, one quarter of 1% um, uh, local option income tax. We don't have local sales taxes in, in, in Indiana, I wish we did because we could collect a lot of sales tax with our convention and sporting industry, uh, but the legislature didn't give it to us. We, that's one of the revenue streams we did ask for. They just gave us uh, more income tax capacity. But it is the first dedicated revenue stream for transit we've ever had in our community. This is also, we're not a, we're not a referendum state. We don't have a history of, of referenda. When we constitutionally passed our uh, uh, property taxes in 2008, we moved inch towards more referenda. This was the first uh, non-school referendum to raise revenue in the state's history. And we were able to win uh, 6 and 40. Big issue was less than $10 a month for the average Indy family. Uh, something to consider. Do not minimize that cost. $10 to you and me might not sound like a lot, but to a lot of families, $10 a month is significant. So don't minimize the impact that even a small tax like this will have on a family's budget. That's something really to consider. Um, we're not, you know, we've heard a lot, oh, Indianapolis is a car city. We don't need transit. Nobody's ever going to ride it, right? In the time that we went to Denver, in the time we held our first referendum, there are several things that we did as a community that embraced multimodal transportation. I agree with Joe. You go the roads versus buses, roads are going to win every single time. We really talked about building a system of integrated personal mobility, of which a strong highway and road network and a fixed route transit system are the base components. But some of the things that we did in between, uh, as we built support, it really did change some of the culture of, of Indianapolis. Uh, we went through a rezoning process. We rezoned our, uh, for the first time since LBJ was president. We went from one zoning code, essentially for 400 square miles, to uh, form-based zoning. So local communities could decide if they wanted higher density development based on what their individual community, uh, not what is based on 400 square miles. So rewrote our zoning codes to, you can't have good transit policy without good land use policy. 
uh, Plan 2020, strategic planning about around uh, community development. We took a peanut butter approach, you know, spread the peanut butter uh, uh, approach to community development, and we started to really target nodes instead of, of spreading spreading things too thin. We started targeting nodes for redevelopment, and one of the criteria we used was, are you on a planned transit line? So you double down your efforts on your investment along transit corridors, along uh, high density residential and job uh, job borders. Uh, we introduced the cultural trail, and I got to tell you, I am. Uh, Part of the converted. I, I understand some of you might be coming to Indianapolis in a couple of weeks to go to a bike conference. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, uh, 10 years ago, the only time you saw an adult riding a bike in Indianapolis was when they had a DUI. <laughs> um, and so this thing, uh, this our, our community foundation came up with this concept called the cultural trail. It was going to be a very prominent, dedicated walk and bike path seven and a half miles that connected all of our cultural destinations. So the convention center, our, our museum district, our, down, our, our core of our downtown, the old historic neighborhoods around downtown. I said, like, man, this is seems, seems a little nanny pammy. I mean, a bike trail, I don't know about that. And since it's open, they've seen over $1.2 billion increase in assessed valuation along uh, the cultural trail because of the prominence. It really did change the culture. Cummins Engines just built their uh, distribution headquarters in downtown Indianapolis. They specifically wanted to go right on the cultural trail because of the amenities. We started building bike hubs. Um, we had our, this, the, the Marine, uh, the former Marine Colonel Mayor, uh, when we, we sold our, our water and wastewater company to our public uh, charitable trust gas company, and we were able to put $500 million in our road and street infrastructure. And he insisted, that when we're doing all this road repair, we are going to create bike hubs. And so we, we went from less than 10 miles of bike lanes in our city to 200 in like three or four years. And so now people actually use bikes to commute to work, even in the winter. I don't, I don't get it, but they do it. Um, we also adopted, uh, we, we, along with the cultural trail, we, uh, the Pacers, uh, go Pacers, somebody says go Pacers. Go. Um, uh, the Pacers bike share. Um, it is so successful that they've had to expand it in more and more communities saying, when are you gonna get out of the downtown area? And, and bring and bring bike share to my community. Uh, we also adopted a complete streets policy, and we have the uh, 2013 Smart Growth America Complete Streets Policy uh, of the, the year. If you're not familiar with complete streets policies, they basically uh, encourage or require planners and, and engineers to consider other modes of transportation than a single occupancy vehicle uh, as they are doing road, street, and other uh, 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 transportation thing. So these things are not necessarily high cost, but can do a lot to change the, uh, the culture of a community, to help them really embrace multimodal technology. The other thing, uh, oh, Blue Indy, uh, the, full, the first all electric car share program in the nation. Um, this, is, this was kind of controversial uh, because it was more about the rollout than what, what they actually did with Blue Indy because they went and took some of the best parking spaces and put in the electric vehicle infrastructure, the charging station, and dedicated them to to Blue Indy. But so you can start to see people, once they see that they have options, they have Uber and Lyft. Uh, they have the Blue Indy. They have a transit system. They have a bike, uh, a bike program. Uh, you now have options. So maybe you, you, before you had two cars as a family, maybe you can get rid of one, right? Because if you take the bus downtown, but you need to get home for an emergency, you can call Uber and Lyft or you can hop in a Blue Indy. It's actually really affordable and they always have the best parking spaces again. So these are things that you can do uh, culturally to change it. I'm a big fan of the five R's of effective advocacy. Uh, you, as you're lobbying or you're running a political campaign, you have to have the right message that comes from the right person, to the right person, at the right time, and in the right manner. And to do this really, really well, you have to build coalitions. You have to build coalitions of diverse interests. And you can see, these are, these are people that we participate, that were our partners, all the way from plan development, <coughs> the legislative advocacy, to the campaign. Uh, AIA, ULI, I'm a ULI member, uh, Joe is too. Um, we brought in Jess Beck and Jarrett Walker and all the national experts in Transportation for America and Smart Growth America to help us think through these things. Uh, we built support with our regional mayors. We had the Urban League, our universities and hospitals, the community college. The most impactful testimony I had in the legislative process was, um, was a community college student. 
because typically a community college student is not going to be your traditional uh, 17, 18 year old going to college. They typically already have a job, so they're balancing work and school, and oftentimes they have families. And so we had these, uh, these moms that were taking classes at Ivy Tech or community college and saying, I'm working to improve my life, to improve my family's life, to take care of my children, to provide a better life for my children. And to do that, I've got to go to the community college, but I'm transit dependent. So I've got to leave work, go to the community college, and take care of my family. And if the bus only comes every hour, and I miss that bus, how often can you keep a job? How often can you keep, uh, keep, going, keep going to that class? And that's, that's the, the thing about the frequency. You stop, and when you get to that 15 minute frequency, you stop planning your life around transit. You start living your life knowing that the transit frequency will be there to support what you were trying to do. Um, the hospitals. The, the number of patients that our hospitals see that don't make their appointments because they don't have transportation is astounding. Um, so they really embraced it. Our, our Young Professionals Network, our ARC of Indiana, so disabled and, and mentally disabled residents, our Realtor Group, AARP again, uh, Aging in Place, Hoosier Environmental Council, United Way, IndyCan, the Congregational Action Network, it's a social justice group, um, unions, Goodwill, our List Network, I think this really speaks to the type of issue that transit is, right? Because these are groups that oftentimes are opposed to each other on issues. Uh, the chamber and labor coming together. Old people, young people coming together. Uh, community development, economic development. It really brought these diverse groups that are often opposed to each other together because it impacts so many facets of our community and, and our quality of life. So having this diverse network meant we had very, very diverse uh, messaging. I, we, we created a standard slide deck for our, our, our transit reference. We did, I just think I was doing three, four, five presentations a day. We would go to an opening of an envelope if it meant one more uh, vote. But by creating this really diverse coalition, we could, we did a speakers bureau. We could send people in uh, to uh, to their constituency, and they could speak more authentically to their constituency than just the chamber guy could. And so, having that, we were able to talk about uh, workforce mobility, ex-offender reentry, job opportunities, summer youth employment. That's a big initiative for our mayor. Uh, getting younger kids into job access and career uh, career training earlier in their lives. Talent attraction, higher ed community, and charter schools. Uh, so we love charter schools. The Walton Family Foundation has been a big supporter of our, our ed reform movement. And, um, but in Indiana, charter schools get per pupil funding, but they don't get transportation funding. Our charter schools are now partnering with our public transportation system to provide transit for their transportation for their uh, students. So we could go to very conservative lawmakers and say, hey, we're, we're helping charter schools here. And we actually got votes by, from legislators that bought into this, uh, this partnership between Indigo and the charter schools. Uh, extracurricular activities, self-sufficiency and independent living, healthier living, um, better service, longer hours, shorter waits, more direct service, uh, and then smart urban planning. So you really had, you could touch different audiences with different messages, and that is what a broad coalition will allow you to do. So here's uh, some of our campaign's uh, uh, keys to success. We do have to have that broad coalition, but you also can't have uh, run a campaign by committee. And I mean, you can have your campaign committee with your figureheads, but when it comes down to it, you've got to have a pretty tight-knit group of professionals that are making the call, knowing where to invest and when to invest your money in campaign activities. But what we did is we stood up a nonprofit called Transit Drives Indy. It was housed at our community foundation, uh, and they were really focused on grassroots activation, community relations. Um, they coordinated all of our speaking events, our rallies, our media responses. So it wasn't just the chamber speaking on this. Uh, but then we started to pack. Our realtors group and the chamber came together. Uh, we got some funding from the National Association of Realtors. This is the first time that they felt comfortable seeing a chamber and a realtors group come together to form one pack. It was called Keep Indy Moving Forward. Uh, AARP provided in-kind services. Uh, we had a budget of $700,000 of cash and in-kind. Uh, we hired some national consultants uh, for polling and messaging but not for campaigns. We hired local campaign professionals 
to do our campaign. People that had a proven track record of running and winning traditional political campaigns in our community. Um, $700,000 in 2016. We had an extremely, one of the most contested Senate races. Uh, we have uh, all 100, I'm oh, sorry, 125 legislative races. Uh, in our central Indiana region, we had about 30 legislative races. Uh, we had all the congressional races, and of course we had the presidential election. We won 60-40 and we never did one TV ad. We did a ton of interviews and, and earned media, but we uh, built a very sophisticated voter ID model. You've heard a lot about this micro-targeting using data. Uh, we did that. We, we polled, we built a voter ID model, and that allowed us to hyper-target uh, our uh, digital and our, uh, our mail campaigns. We had tons of yard signs. I think I'm actually still picking some up you know, two years later. Uh, people are not happy with me about that. Uh, but we did a uh, speaker's bureau. I mean, go everywhere, be everywhere. Uh, direct mail, billboards, radio, newspaper, digital, again, but without any TV. And uh, that was, we were nervous, but we knew that we weren't going, we would be wasting our money if we tried to go on TV because we just, um, we couldn't get the saturation with all of the other noise of the 2016 election. Um, so that's how we won. Again, the first, um, first non-school referendum to raise revenue in the state's history, and I feel pretty proud about that. Uh, but it's, uh, understand, don't get in this if you want to do this tomorrow. I know Joe says faster, 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 but this can be a long, long slog. You oppose something in 2012. So you've been working on it for a long time. We've been working on it for a long time. I literally started the chamber in, 20, uh, in 2003 as an intern. 2004, I'm sitting on a Blue Ribbon Commission uh, trying, to, to, trying to find out how we save our transit system. So I've literally been working on this issue for a long time, and it does take time. And some of those other investments and other issues that you can work on that really change the culture will make a huge difference. Thank you very much, and I think Joe and I are gonna take some questions. Yes, sir. What lessons did you learn leading up to, you kind of touched on this, but what advice to an area that has many similarities with both of you that is somewhere behind in the process? Well, what advice would you give? I'll, I'll start one, which is, um, I'll, I'll maybe 1A and 1B and related. Um, make sure you have the right plan for your community. You cannot just, uh, and, and by, in order to do that, you have to vet it, you have to, uh, go through a process figure out what you're trying to accomplish. You have that accomplishment in terms of you have those conversations with a number of stakeholders, a number of leaders, get it out to the public. You said poll, 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 can, cannot agree enough. That's exactly right. Make sure you have the right plan for your community. Certainly the right plan. Um, and as you go through this process, um, we have a guy that works in our, our building, a big law firm, and he used to wear this huge um, pin. I don't know why he chose this as, as the way to message, but he was dead set. You know what we really need is a trolley, downtown trolley for all the visitors. And we looked at him and said, "We're trying to build a system that serves the residents of our community, that helps people access jobs, educational opportunities, and and uh, and healthcare." I understand the benefit, you know, uh, a lot of communities are investing in the downtown trolleys. They're really neat, and, and a lot of tourists just love them. But that's not what we're trying to build. So the system that fits your community, pull early, pull up, and, uh, and minimize the distractions. And if I, if I could sure. just real quick, and it's really what, what Mark said, which is know why you're doing what you want. Know why you're doing it. So the right plan, but know why it is the right plan. So start, start with your goals, which you're trying to accomplish. Mark did a great job of that, what, what you were describing for your community. I think we did that well in our market as well. Know why you're doing it, make the plan, match that, and then pull it to make sure that you're consistent, because otherwise you will not be successful. Let's hypothetically say in, in a bit we have the right plan for Northwest Arkansas. Having the right plan does not guarantee that you'll get enough public support and ballot over the Pacific body. You mentioned, you both mentioned education. What kind of education? You know, to me, the, the statistics about tripling people 65 and over, that you have food deserts. But is that the sort of message that you can use to get people behind it? Again, that's why coalitions are so important. 
and building out the broad coalition. It can't just be the business community running it. Because me going to talk about food desert issues, I care deeply about them. I am involved in, in community development uh, corporations across the city. Um, but I'm not the expert in it. And so allowing yourself to open yourself up to working with groups that you may uh, not be the most comfortable with or to have opposed at other times, uh, really building those coalitions. Um, and I think polling will help you identify what people care about. Again, we didn't talk once about congestion. Nashville, Atlanta, all they're talking about is congestion and how they're going to manage growth. But that didn't work for us. And I think that's, that's uh, something to be, um, uh, to think about if you are pulling in national experts. And we did. We worked with Transportation for America, just like Raleigh did. Uh, Jarrett Walker designed our system. Um, but be skeptical of those transit campaign professionals that will come in from outside of your community. It's great to get some ideas from them. Um, but they often come with a cookie cutter approach and the cookie cutter message. With everything he said, um, I'll add a couple other things. So there has to be an element of timing. And so even the right plan uh, has to be at the right time. So uh, as you grow. So at some point, you get a critical mass of political support, or you get a critical mass of community awareness, or they should become more salient. It's something, there's a certain trigger that now the community's ready to go. And that doesn't mean that something's wrong prior to that, because there are a number of issues that a community deals with. Education will always be, in my view, the number one issue that a community deals with, because that's the most foundational thing that you have. Uh, I'm leading a transportation group, I've been doing it for 15 years. And I do not think transportation is the most important issue in our market or any other. So timing is going to be a part of it. You mentioned coalitions, completely agree with that. And, and for the reasons, not just the additional support, but the additional voices, additional perspectives that gives you and what the, and what the plan or what the system can do. And, and you mentioned also education. Uh, and here we're talking education about transit. Um, going externally to other areas and say, so you say you visit Indianapolis, or you visit Raleigh, or you visit Nashville, or wherever you go. Uh, you could do it and say, I'd like that trolley, or I'd like that BRT, but you really should ask for this. They went through this, they in the other community, and, they, and what decisions uh, did they make, and what was impacting those decisions? And what are things that are happening here back in Northwest Arkansas that are important to us, that maybe is something new that hasn't been an issue five years from now? My, my impression here, um, just looking at the growth, is that I-49, former 540, uh, has been significantly more congested than it was 10 years ago. I think people can see that, they can feel that. That may be a salient issue. Um, Indianapolis is known as having one of the best uh, freeway networks in the country, less traffic congestion. Uh, we have less traffic congestion than many of our peers, but I will tell you the traffic congestion was a big issue for us, and that's what made it a different deal for us. Uh, but even there, we were careful. If you looked at the messaging, we didn't say it reduced traffic. We said it relieved it. And there's a very specific thing, because having an alternative can be a source of relief. It's not the same as reducing it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's one of the, the messages. I think St. Louis, uh, some of us ride it, all of us need it, or something, you know, something like that, where, um, you know, okay, you don't want to ride it, but if you can divert 10% of the people that are driving on your highways, you still benefit, right? I think it's also important, if you have other ideas or other things that you believe are important to your community, if you want to build a cultural trail, if you want to build bike lanes, if you want to invest in roads and streets, other communities have done bigger transportation packages of which transit is a component, uh, but if you are thinking about building a system of personal mobility, there might be value in adding other infrastructure investments along with transit. That's actually, and I hope you're okay with this kind of going That's one line yeah. like this. We're doing this. So we did it for you. Yeah, but it's all we're rolling live here. So uh, San Diego was the first city we visited in 2005. Uh, more density packed than our city and yours, I think, in many ways, too. Uh, they were going through a referendum, and it was two thirds for roads and one third for transit expansion, what they call their trolley, which is the light rail system there. Uh, that was what they needed for, for what they were trying to work. Mm -hmm. And it worked out very, very well for them. Um, we would not have been successful, I don't think, if we did not have a robust parallel um, freeway and intersection expansion program going on. We need, that needed to happen. People need to know that was happening, because people would, would have said, 
one percent of the people in Raleigh are using transit. You're going to vote one hundred percent of the sales tax. No chance. Uh, I do want to mention one other thing. You asked uh, for uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, how do you know what you need to do? Uh, the plan matters. Uh, certainly, the funding source matters a great deal. Uh, people need to buy into that. They need to believe it's it's fair. Uh, it will generate enough money to do what you want it to do. Uh, and there's also a certain thing about scalability. And so let's say here's your plan, and we want to do, I don't know, I mean, you, you know your market, but let's say you want to do bus rapid transit of some sort um, from uh, Bentonville to North all the way down to the Fable, uh, or something like that. Uh, you might scale part, part of that. You might do a piece of it. Or you might say, let's just run buses on the shoulder of 49 to get started, which is a very low cost. When we started bus on shoulder, our entire bus on shoulder program cost $32,000. I want to come back to that. Yeah. But first, if you are at a, a gathering or a party or a dinner event in Northwest Arkansas, transportation comes up, you're likely to hear at least one or two people say one or two things. I want to get to react to that. Every time I see a bus from Ozark Regional Transit, it has one person on it. Why would we think it could work? And B, you might hear someone say, Why are we thinking about buses? We got light, we should do light rail right down the median of I believe not. You start on the, yeah, I'll, I'll take the uh, empty bus because we hear that a lot. Um, I would challenge you to see, look at buses at uh, irregular hours because a lot of people, if you have a system that is not convenient and it is a, a, a system that the people that have to ride it or, you know, that must ride it are the ones that are riding it, they're probably not working eight to five hours. Um, I'd, I'd also say, the only systems that have seen ridership increases are the systems that are doing just what we are doing. And that is going to the ridership model and doubling down on your routes with highest residential and job density, extending the service hours and the frequency. If it's not a convenient option, guess what? People aren't going to use it. You invest in it and you create the convenience, it becomes a convenient alternative to owning a car. Owning a car, in Indianapolis, if you are on, you know, kind of the bottom 30 income percent of incomers, is extremely expensive. We have low housing costs. That affordability of our housing is eaten up by the cost of owning and operating a single occupancy vehicle. You can spend up to 30 percent of your income in owning a car if you are in that bottom 30 percent of income. So, I, I just, it's we're not. And here's one thing we we heard a lot. Um, well. Buses are for poor people. Then when we put the rapid transit line, oh, you're just building a system for rich people. We were building a system for all people. It is not a system for rich people or poor people. It is a system that should be convenient and used by all. I, I agree with everything you said. Um, when it comes to the, and you'll hear the empty bus conversation almost everywhere. Well, there are freeways that are empty in portions of the day, too. I mean, you know, we're, we're here. We love those. I mean, all three of these lanes are only congested an hour or two a day. What's going on? I mean, right. I mean there's yes. reasons you, you do that. Uh, the second thing would be is if your bus system is currently ineffective, and there's awareness of that, then saying we want to improve it to make it better just would feel kind of like a rational thing to do. It would be like saying, Hey, here's a road that doesn't have a sidewalk over the bridge, and I don't see any pedestrians going across that at all. I don't see them swimming across there to get back and forth the other side. But it does. I mean, you, if you don't have the, the facility in place uh, that's rational and reasonable, they're not going to do it. That doesn't. It's not an excuse to just blindly put service everywhere. You've got to study and find the best locations and the frequent service, which you guys do a terrific job with your model change, and we're going to be converting to that as well. Um, that will help. The other thing you mentioned is about the light rail down the median. And uh, so I would maybe say it a little differently. Uh, light rail itself, or bus rapid transit, or trampolines, whatever you want, whatever you want for your transportation system, there's nothing inherently good or bad. The question is really, it's more of an economic opportunity cost question, which is, what am I giving up? So you could, you could, in theory, look at light rail down the median of 49, or down that business route that goes to the towns, or whatever, or BRT, or whatever. And so you'd have to ask yourself, how much does it cost to do it? Um, how likely is am I going to get the funding? And what else am I giving up by investing that amount of money and that resource as opposed to building a broader network? 
Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but I would start that way. I have a gut feeling what the, what you, whether you need light rail or not here, given your market, but you could say it more dispassionately and say, look at the trail. Yeah. And, and I think, too, you know, rail is sexy, bus is not so much. We brought the buses that we were going to buy and that we are purchasing to Indianapolis. We let people ride them. We let people get on them. They do not, they do not feel, our bus rapid transit buses do not feel like a local bus. Right. The other thing, too, a line is not a system. If you are not investing in the feeder, your rapid, no rapid transit line will work. You need to be able to bring people, and this is even when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, and the, we're largely talking about first mile, last mile. It's bringing people into the, 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 the main rapid transit corridors. Our rapid transit corridor, we were, we were, we were committed to moving forward with the, the red line, our first rapid transit corridor with or without the referent. But it would not be as successful without the rerouting of our system and going to that ridership model that feeds into that. Think of it as the spine of the system, but you need something to, you need the ribs, and you need the capillaries, and you need the veins and the arteries, all of it to go into the, the main nervous system. And that's what our rapid transit line is. You go into that one. Right. Is there a magic equation or metric to figure out the ridership versus coverage issue of what works and what will hit the magic spot? It's, it's really, I mean, like, you'll have to deal with the equity issue for sure. Um, in Indianapolis, we're 400 square miles. You can be in a $8 million condo on the heart of downtown, 1880s Queen Anne, uh, entering summer, 18, 1980s, you know, 1950s, shotgun housing, 1980s, suburban development, and a working farm, all within a 15-minute drive. We have very, very different development patterns, and part of it is to sell people on, um, part of it's your messaging, right? We didn't dip below 40% in any city county council district, but we certainly lost the bottom half of our county, and that was because they are the least dense, they have the most narrow roads. They are not. They were not built. They were working farms um, in the heart of the city. The, the, they were not built for dense development. And so that's where your messaging comes in too, because that the, our polling showed. Yes, they know they're not going to get service. Maybe we can eventually expand service down there, but right now they're not really ready for it. But if it's helping more residents get to jobs, then they are going to support it. And I would say going back to. Um, but what are your goals? And if it is the way Mark described, which is this is not transit for the poor, it's not transit for the rich, it's transit for everyone. And that's what we're trying to do for our community as well. The more it's going to be like that, the more you're going to be migrating more towards a ridership model to serve as many people as you can. You'll not, you're unlikely to get to 100%. Uh, I do think uh, as autonomous vehicles come into play, it is possible you start getting closer and closer to that, because what I do think will happen over time is your autonomous vehicles will do what he's describing as the first mile, last mile, for the very low, low density areas, you can serve them that way, which actually frees up even more services for the high frequency routes, which, which is the really terrific one he's describing to find them. So I think over time you're gonna see that. And even without that, if the goal is for everyone, you're gonna be migrating more towards a ridership. Um, when it, if it's more for the or, so to speak, let's say transit dependent, it'll be more towards a coverage or spread out model. And I, I would describe it to Raleigh as that. And we've been moving away from that. Yeah, we, we've made the mistake. We've, we've sacrificed frequency and service hours <coughs> for coverage. In the past. In the past, yeah. yeah not quite. Yeah. I've got a couple other questions. We've only got a few minutes left, so I, I would like to give anyone an opportunity out here who has a question. Yes, sir. Mark, you made the comment that uh, years ago, Indigo had the mentality of transit was for uh, the poor. Uh, it's a social service. How did you guys change that? Uh, uh, certainly, I, I think um, we, we joke we're not building the system as a millennial utopia. <laughs> but I think that um, <laughs> consumer preferences are changing. Um, so as, you know, timing is a lot of that. Um, and people, as you see more people move from outside your region, here's the thing, all the people that are moving to work for Eli Lilly or Anthem probably didn't grow up in Indianapolis, so they're probably coming from another major metro area, and they're used to, to transit. We have a lot of people that get to our city, move here, and they're like, what do you mean there's no buses, right? Um, 
or there's no trains, or what, there's no transit. Uh, and so I think part of it is, as, and I know that as you grow, a lot of people are coming from other metro areas, they're probably going to be more used to having a robust transit system. Uh, but, but again, consumer preferences, and then those, those small cultural changes we, made, we started to make, right? As our aging, our population started to age a little bit, we saw more millennials moving downtown, we invested in our bike infrastructure, we went to form-based zoning code to allow denser developments. All of these things are kind of just like, just a little bit moving the whole picture this way and more supportive of transit. Well, you didn't ask me, I am gonna mention something that hopefully will build a little bit of that. I hadn't really mentioned it, yet, because this is something that was actually not part of our way transit plan for Raleigh, um, but is now being added region-wide, and that is starting July 1, uh, the entire transit system is going to be free for everyone under the age of 19. Nice. Oh, wow. And so every youth in the region will be able to use any transit bus. Now, they'll have to sign up for it once, for whatever the format is to, to verify their age, of course, to go through, but once they have that, uh, and we already have partially there now. We already have the largest, um, I, mean, I believe it's the largest municipal-based free system in the country. Chapel Hill has already has been free for many years. The ridership doubled as soon as they made it that way. They pay for most of it to the student fees. North Carolina State University, which is the largest university in the Carolinas, their system has been free. Duke University has a smaller system, that's been free. Raleigh and downtown is a circulator, that's free. And now we're gonna make it free for all youth. Doesn't mean for not all the whole system won't be free, but uh, starting July 1, we believe that's both consistent with what Mark's describing in terms of what change in consumer preferences are, particularly for that demographic, but it also starts building a culture of using transit. Right. Mm -hmm. I, another thing, too, is you're going to get opponents, and they're going to be loud, but they're not necessarily reflective of the general voting population. And I'll say, our rapid transit corridor, the red line, goes right near my neighborhood, uh, kind of 1920s bungalows, 1920s suburbia, right? Indianapolis suburbia. Um, very loud, lawsuits filed. Uh, we don't need transit. Those people down there need transit, but we all have three car garages. They don't realize how bad they sound when they say that. <laughs> Uh, uh, but also, they, they, they kind of messed up their opposition messaging as well. Because they would say, well, you're going to put in this fixed route transit system, this bus route transit system with these built-in stationaries, and it's going to cause so much dense development because people want to be close to that rapid transit line. Oh, but nobody's going to ride it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it both ways. So it's either going to ruin the fabric of your neighborhood because so many people want to be close to it, or nobody's riding it. You can't have it both. And so, what they didn't realize is that a lot of the investment, well, first of all, Indianapolis is a streetcar city. The, the community we're talking about, my, my neighborhoods, are streetcar suburbs. They are literally transit-oriented development from the 1920s and 1930s. And so you can't ruin the fabric of the original intent of the neighborhood. But what they didn't realize is that younger families are starting to move in. So I bought my house from somebody that lived there for 30 years. They bought their house from somebody that lived there for 30 years. It's the families, right? As people age out of their homes, they want to downsize, they want to go to a condo. What they didn't realize is all these young families were buying along the corridor in anticipation that they could use that transit corridor once it got up and running. And so some of the biggest attractions were the people that had been there the longest and felt that it was going to change the fabric of the neighborhood and we kind of kind of look to the future and say hey look isn't it great that all these young families are investing back in the urban core all right five minutes passing by you to the informal gathering slash refreshments we'll take a we'll do a couple more questions quickly <clears throat> would you speak more about the adjustments that you have made or are planning to make about the first and last mile challenges of the BRT system, getting people to and from the bus stop? Challenges of the first and last mile, I'm sure I can start with some of it. Since both communities are going to BRT, um, and it's ongoing, so we're not as far along as Indianapolis is. Uh, we, we voted the exact same day for our BRT, Raleigh and Indianapolis did, but as you've heard, uh, they were ahead of us, and in fact, they were actually going to build one of the BRT lines whether they could pass the referendum or not. And so we were very, but our community was very different. We were, it was all contingent on that vote, so we're a little behind. Uh, but, but some of our resources, and, some, and I understand from Mark, some of his resources as well, can be used for pedestrian access to those. So in terms of last mile, uh, sometimes that's just walking or biking. Uh, we, a, a year ago, had no bike share system. 
uh, in anywhere in the triangle, uh, again, Mark's uh, Indianapolis a little bit further ahead. Uh, we now have, I believe, six different bike shares going on. Not all, not all six in every city and so on, but more being expanded. To us, the bike share are going to help create some of that last mile connectivity uh, as well. Yes, yeah, so certainly uh, going to the ridership, creating that, that feeder network. Uh, we are actually one of the selling points of some of the uh, kind of 1950s uh, housing that was developed around, around large industrial facilities. There weren't sidewalks, right? It was all about your car. Uh, so we are actually using uh, some of our transit resources to build better pedestrian infrastructure where, the, where sidewalks do not exist. So you're not walking in a ditch and sitting in a ditch for a, a transit stop. Um, but we're actually thinking about the next generation mobility. We formed a, a group with our community foundation, largely the same group that, that thought about transit and said, okay, we've got the fixed route transit system. Where do we go next? How do we start to uh, think about and plan for um, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles? What kind of infrastructure, smart, smart city infrastructure? We just uh, joined the, the Smart City Collaborative. What kind of investments do we need to make sure that we are going to be prepared for the next gen mobility really focus on that last mile, first mile, and the less dense areas to bring people into the system. Autonomous vehicles will not displace transit. It's about geometry. Uh, but they can complement each other. We did have a lot of uh, what I call the tech bros. Hey man, we don't need transit because autonomous vehicles are going to be here tomorrow. Autonomous vehicles are here. They're a reality. But we had to have cash for clunkers to pull cars from the 1970s off the road. Th this notion that autonomous vehicles are going to be uh, widespread and, and highly adopted in the next two years, which is literally what the opposition was saying, is just not real. Was somebody said earlier, it's the transportation, uh, the transportation option of the future, and always will be. Uh, but uh, you know, you start to plan. You don't just sit there static and say, "Hey, we passed this plan and we're done." You, your plans will evolve and your technologies will evolve. But there is one element of technology that, that does work and also helps make people feel better about it. So not, not just the last mile, but the whole system, which is being able to see where your buses are in real time. Our region, yes. our region was, this. you guys have been having some of these things we respect. One thing we did go is so we were the first region in the country to have all of our bus systems with fully predictive bus uh, capabilities on your phone. So I, right now, I can look on, on my phone and find, pick any bus stop in the region in the triangle area, just click on it, whatever, and it'll tell me the exact number of the bus, and the time that the next bus will be there, and I can actually watch the buses moving around the network like it's a grid. And so, uh, one of the biggest sources of uncertainty, I think, and I think very reasonable for buses, is that when you go to that bus stop, whether it's nice or not, did I just miss that bus? Did it pick it two minutes ahead? With your app, you know. There it is. In fact, it's even better because then, if you're in your office or your school or wherever it is, you can track it and you know exactly when to leave your house and start walking to your bus stop. And that is a tremendous source of comfort. And, it, and it, to me, what it's doing, it's reducing a barrier to using or releasing a considered transit. You can also do multimodal trip planning on certain apps. That's one of the things that we're looking at with our next gen personal mobility is, okay, I want to take the bike share. I want to coordinate my trip between taking the bus to the bike share that takes me to the Blue Indy, that takes me to the Uber and Lyft. So you can coordinate different modes of transportation and plan your entire trip um, uh, all in one app. And those, those, are, those are about to explode. Sorry. All right. I'm Sorry. Ask, no, no, you're fine. Uh, I'm over, but I want to ask two quick questions so you can answer them quickly. Sure. I, I was, I'm curious. Well, obviously, like to talk. <laughs> well, no, and I'm sure everybody else has questions during the informal slash refreshments gathering. <laughs> But I, I'm curious, you mentioned you know, the, the buses on the shoulders. Yes. So this is something that's unconventional and for some people will be counterintuitive. Yep. The city where I live and work, we have two blocks of one street where you're asked to park backwards. And when that was implemented, we lost our ever-loving minds. Oh, oh, we are yes. familiar with that too. Yes. yes. We have the package part. So is there a danger in, in some of these unconventional things being shown to people? Who... Sure. Okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's that, that's true with everything. I mean, no. it, it, everything, life involves risk, right? And so yeah. what you have to do, um, and so I'll, I'll offer a, a um, I'll offer a thought on that. It applies to the bus on the shoulder, but it applies more broadly to things like that. Um, you need to, if you're going to attempt something new, um, and you identify, here is the place where we will get the absolute bang, best bang for the buck for this. Do not put it there. 
Instead, put it in a place where it will work and you will minimize opposition so you can prove the concept. And then you have the opportunity to put it in a place with the highest and best thing. Because if you put it in the wrong spot, even though it would work perfectly if you get opposition, then ever loving whatever you said, it, that would be bad. So, um, so from bus on shoulder, we picked a, uh, a, we work with the North Carolina DOT and our regional transit agency. And we knew the place that had the most congestion, and that was the Raleigh, Raleigh okay, in our, in our freeway system there. And we had a particular place where the shoulders were kind of narrow for a spot, not just a very short spot, maybe 200 feet. We said, let's not put it there, let's put it uh, in Durham because that's a little less congested, the shoulders are a little wider, it's only one jurisdiction to deal with, and prove the concept. And it worked. We got no opposition. Everybody worked on it very nicely. And then over time, then we expanded it. Now, at the, at the time, it was put in. I think this is still true. We the largest, we the second largest in the country in terms of the bus on shoulder system. Cost is absolutely minimal. Here's a counter argument. Our counter example. Uh, you all have you have roundabouts? A lot of them around here, or not? Get some. Okay. So, um, in the right spot, they're great. But if you put yeah, that's right. If you put if you put a roundabout in a spot where either it won't work, or to put it differently, that it will be perceived as not working, then it can sour the whole thought about all of them. So we, uh, our community, installed a two-lane roundabout near our university, and it was a very tight location, um, and we ended up having a crash rate of one per day almost. Uh, no, probably. Property damage only speeds are very low. But the, the narrative that came out was people in North Carolina cannot drive two lanes around a circle. Now we're the home of NASCAR. We can do multiple people around a circle. That's obviously not true. And at even higher speeds. But I learned from us in IndyCar. That's true. That's true. Um, but the narrative is there that the two lane ones are a challenge. So we're still putting these one lanes everywhere. But if we had picked a couple spots that we knew were going to work, and then this one would put it, it didn't work, we would say, well, there was a problem with the site, not the concept. There's my three advice here. Last question, how important are the extended hours? You mentioned the anecdote was, you can get, to, we can get you to the Pacers game, you can't get you home. It, it really depends on the type of economy you have and, and where the jobs are and what kind of jobs they are. So for us, um, we have a large logistics. I mean, Walmart is the largest private employer in the state of Indiana. We have tons of logistics jobs. We have tons of service jobs. We have tons of, of hospitality and restaurant jobs. The, these are the people that generate over a billion dollars a year in sales tax for our state, right? Uh, they make our city work. And so for us, extended service hours later, earlier in the morning and later at night, again, I'll say, if you see an empty buses, why don't you wake up at five and see when the service workers are going to work? Or why don't you, uh, the, the, the 12 o'clock or one o'clock, when they're released from the, uh, the the logistics facility, right? So it depends on what your economy is and what types of jobs uh, you're trying to, to serve. Uh, I would say the same, and plus it's just, you're just reducing a barrier to using or considering transit to be done. I will say that the uh, our rapid transit line, because it connects our, our kind of cultural district and the bar district to downtown, uh, everybody wanted to call it a drunk bus and because we were running later. Well, one thing I wanted to say about the, the red line and the, the, the loud people, they don't reflect the voters. The highest voting percentages and totals we got in a referendum were along the red line, despite the biggest outcry and pushback from, from community partners. They're loud, but they're, they're small. Joe, Mark, thank you both very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.